real. Ashley's a robot. Well, based on that line read, she's not the only one. Welcome, my friends, to Power Rangers Turbo. Since my initial review of this back in 2010, I've had a chance to see more of the franchise than ever before, so a lot of my statements back then come off as very harsh towards a season that probably didn't deserve it. However, despite that, I still don't like this season, and I will not hold back on why I dislike it. I think my problem with it is that it's... brainless. That might seem like an odd statement to make concerning a season of Power Rangers, but hear me out. Power Rangers has always had stupid things about it. Silly things, nonsensical things. Some of these are just occurrences meant to appeal to children, while others are a result of the Sentai footage, where some of the goofier elements in Japan are either considered normal, or at least even more hilarious there than here. And rest assured, if you're following along with this for the first time, I've already pointed out many of those dumb things. But this season feels especially brainless after what has come before. Bear in mind that this is the fifth season of the show, and we've seen a lot. While the characters haven't had arcs, there has been a sense of escalation of threat, of relationships being kindled, and a serious situation treated as a serious situation. And when it comes to the Rangers, that seems to still be there, but it's all the trappings that make you tilt your head. It feels like it's trying really, really hard to appeal to kids. Now, the show is for kids, I don't want to underplay that. But it hasn't felt like it's been trying to be for kids for so long. It felt more like an action-adventure show that was appropriate for all ages. Sure, it wasn't sophisticated, but it hasn't felt like it was dumbing itself down either. Here, though, yeah, it feels like the show got stupider. Part of my dislike of the season also comes down to my own nostalgia. I loved Zeo as a kid and hated Turbo as that same kid, and it has colored a lot of my opinions. So please bear with me as we trudge through this one. I'll try to be fairer than I was in the original videos, but if I think something is stupid, I'm calling it stupid. To start off, here's a weird bit of behind the scenes. A lot of changes occurred between the end of Zeo and the beginning of Turbo, mostly aesthetic. The power chamber has been upgraded to be brighter, the displays of the old Mighty Morphin suits are gone, replaced by colored tubes, the teleportation effect is different, and worse in my opinion, not that the original effect was great, but just that it was more convincing that they were surrounded by energy, whereas the new effect clearly has them fade out and replaced with the stock effect. Alpha's appearance is different. Bulk and Skull are not only not on their way to France, but they and Lieutenant Stone have managed to get reinstituted into the police force, and despite the promise of Zed proclaiming, we're back, well, the villains just left without any explanation. They get a cameo in the movie, though, when the new villain calls Rita for help. If I knew that, do you think I'd be lying here listening to this? My advice to you, Diva Talks, RUN! <laughs> a lot of the aesthetic stuff can be explained away as advancing technology for the Rangers, but the story stuff? Yeah, no actual resolution is ever offered. The closest we get, as I said, is a bit weird. Amit Baumek, who would later become a story editor and writer on Power Rangers Wild Force, was a fan of the show at the time, and participated in a fan hoax that Australia had produced a series of shorts, much like the Zeo serial, to explain the transition between Zeo and Turbo, involving Serpentera attacking Earth with a bunch of stock footage, bad Australian voiceovers that didn't match the actual actors, and basically it was just a big practical joke that lasted a few years. With most everyone believing that this serial, called Scorpion Rain, great title by the way, was real. The end result being Serpentera destroyed and Zed fleeing, hence why they're no longer a thing in this season. The story would have just ended there, if not for the fact that Amit Baumek, as I said, went on to become a writer and editor on Power Rangers Wild Force, slipping in a few references to Scorpion Rain in an anniversary episode. He apparently even admitted while writing it that, as far as he was concerned, Scorpion Rain was in continuity, even though it really isn't and doesn't match up with the events of that anniversary episode. But whatever, it's just a weird, weird piece of history. And with that, let's just dive into this. The season begins not with the show proper, but a movie. Turbo, a Power Rangers movie. Unlike the first movie, this one is canon with the TV show. Sadly, though, it's still not very good. The positive of the film is that it's basically a bigger budget version of the TV show, keeping the overall flavor of it, but in a larger scope. 
The plot deals with an alien named Larigo who has the knowledge of how to enter a mysterious, mystical island. Larigo is supposed to be this great wizard, yet every time I see him, he looks like an Ewok that was left out in the sun too long. His magic is never particularly impressive, just a bunch of special effects sparkles. Why do I get the feeling this guy was the one who invented the metallic armor? It's really not helped that all of his dialogue, what little there is of it, sounds like he's gargling. <laughs> And the fact that he's apparently harmed by Earth's sun means that whenever we see him, he's always waddling around and looking pathetic. Needless to say, I'm not really buying the great wizard thing with this guy. Now Zordon, giant floating head in a tube. I get a wizard vibe. Anyway, Larigo is being pursued by the space pirate Divatox, who wants to go to the mysterious island of mystery to free an ancient demon named Malagor and marry him. You know, it might not be a traditional relationship, but damn it, I support space pirates marrying lava monsters. Larigo manages to make it to Earth and into the care of the Rangers. However, since trying to prevent two people from getting married is really the kind of thing villains try to do, we needed a better incentive for our heroes to go after them. As such, Divatox kidnaps Kimberly and Jason, because they're two pure souls that she can sacrifice to Malagor. In addition, in order to get Larigo out of hiding, Divatox kidnaps Larigo's wife and son. They try to trade with the Rangers for Kimberly and Jason, but of course Divatox doesn't hold up her end of the bargain and just takes the oversized troll doll. In order to go after them, Zordon decides that the Rangers will need whole new Zords and powers in order to cross into the mysterious island of mystery. And if I may go off on a tangent, there's a subject that always bugs me about this, and that is... WHY?! WHY ARE YOU GETTING THE TURBO POWERS?! WHAT HAPPENED TO THE ZEO POWERS?! THERE WAS NOTHING WRONG WITH THEM! IN FACT, YOUR POWERS ARE SUPPOSED TO ALWAYS BE GETTING STRONGER! WHAT THE HELL WERE YOU PEOPLE THINKING?! CAT EVEN STARTS TO MORPH INTO ZEO RANGER 1 DURING THE MOVIE- GAH! This is one of the missteps of the season. There is no reason why they don't use the Zeo powers anymore. No explanation is offered for what happened to them, why they needed to stop using them, or why the Turbo Zords couldn't just be new Zords for the Zeo Rangers. And yes, there are plenty of fan theories about them being too powerful, but that's just what they are. Fan theories. Not what the actual show says, which is... NOTHING! We don't even know where the turbo powers came from. There's a line in the movie that implies that the rangers themselves created the turbo zords, but that's it. We don't know why these powers are supposedly better than the Zeo powers, or what's actually the source for them. We do know that there were sequences cut from the film that might explain some of the destruction of the Zeo powers. Johnny Young Bosch has said as much, explaining a cut fight scene where he and Tanya went to fight, with said fight ending with their suits torn up. It's not much, but it's something that would have helped explain. Mind you, I would have thought repairing the Zeo powers would be a top priority instead of just outright replacing them when most of the team is still in action, but what do I know? There are rumors that Billy was supposed to make an appearance, that salary disputes over the film were one of the contributing factors for David Yost to leave, but there's nothing really to substantiate that. That being said, from a narrative standpoint, recall that last time he kept disappearing during crises to aid the speculation that he was the Gold Ranger. The theory goes that he was actually developing the turbo powers during that time. It's the best theory to explain where the turbo powers came from, at least, because otherwise Zordon and Alpha can just whip up new powers out of nowhere. The team's acquisition of these new powers is so underwhelming. They put their hands together, then slap a Simon game, and then bam, powers. When Tommy became the White Ranger, he descended from on high like an angel to come save them. When they got the ninja powers, they underwent a ceremony where Ninjor spoke of spirit, swiftness, and the strength that comes from the ninja. The Zeo ceremony wasn't as impressive, but it was helped up by Zordon speaking of the danger they faced and assigning them their new powers and colors, similar to Ninjor's ceremony, as well as the build-up to that moment where they assumed the powers, bolstered still by the great pacing and energy of those two episodes. But this? Oh uh, yeah, you've got cars now. They're super awesome. Here are the keys and your ranger powers. Bye! It's just so damn disappointing and underplayed. And sadly, I must also address what everybody who knows about this season is waiting for. Justin, the new Blue Ranger. Steve Cardenas, who played Rocky, had decided to leave the series. When I made the original version of this video, I erroneously stated it was due to an injury he had sustained while filming Zeo, something also to explain his in-person absence in the final episode of Zeo. However, that is apparently not the case, and I can't find where I originally read that, so there you go. 
It is similar to how it went down in the actual story, though. Rocky is hurt during a martial arts move, severely injuring his back. A 12-year-old named Justin saw the teens teleport and overheard them say that they were the Rangers. He's recruited by Alpha and Zordon to be the Blue Turbo Ranger because shut up. From a behind-the-scenes perspective, the purpose of Justin was to appeal to a new audience, since ratings for Power Rangers were apparently starting to decline. Surprisingly, the competition that Saban was receiving that was stealing all their ratings was from another Saban product, Big Bad Beetleborgs, another American tokusatsu show that adapted Japanese footage to match new stuff produced for America, using footage from the Metal Hero series. Beetleborgs' protagonists were a group of preteens who morphed into adult-sized armored heroes, so it was believed a kid ranger might work on Power Rangers. It, of course, backfired. Newer audiences found him annoying, and older fans thought it was idiotic, which it was. However, I will say that Justin isn't nearly as bad as people make him out to be. No, the problem with Justin is in concept. Bear in mind that kids loved the show when it started, despite it being about teenagers who were in their 20s. Simply having a little kid be a ranger wouldn't bring in new viewers. Actually, the more I watched the season, the more I realized that Justin wasn't really a Gary Stu, as many consider him to be, but rather he was the only one written competently. When people and places start disappearing, he instantly realizes it's Divatox and goes for equipment to get more information. When a villain kidnaps one of the rangers, he goes off with Alpha while the villain gloats to track the signal. Now, plots centered around him tended to be boring or lame, but the character himself wasn't a problem. It's the pandering attitude that's frustrating. As I said, an attempt to appeal more to kids just ended up making it seem more childish than it actually was. Beetleborg's concept worked because that was the concept. Little kids gaining superhuman powers that made them appear to be adults. But Power Rangers was always about teenagers who were pretty much on the cusp of adulthood anyway, casting decisions aside. So adding a little kid who was pretty much treated like the teenagers, and acted like them anyway, just felt stupid. In universe, it feels even dumber. What the hell is Zordon's logic for making the kid a ranger? After all, why not Tommy's brother? He knows the ranger's identities, he's good at martial arts, and he isn't 12! Hell, bring Jason back for another season! They had him for the movie! Anyway, the rangers travel to the mysterious island of mystery, but Divatox succeeds in summoning Malagor after briefly turning Kimberly and Jason evil. The rangers summon their zords, which, again, are cars, and they defeat Malagor. Divatox swears revenge, which will lead us into the series proper. Kimberly and Jason are wasted in the movie. They seem to exist here solely for fan service, though Jason at least was in Zeo, and for some pathos from Tommy when he keeps trying to rescue Kimberly. Nothing comes from it, nor any discussion of the fact that Kimberly, you know, sent him that Dear John letter and all. Maybe there was more to this before all the cuts to the movie, but somehow I doubt it. The Turbo theme is pretty good, addictive, and during the full song, we do get to briefly hear the chords of the original Go Go Power Rangers. Go! Power Rangers Turbo Go! The show has always managed to create some new, memorable fight songs, and Turbo is the same. As bad as the show can get, the music tends to remain pretty awesome. With the exception of the Divatox music, let's just do a quick comparison. Here's Rita's. Short, but to the point. Plus, it keeps the overall music aesthetic of the electric guitars while going on a minor chord. Here's Lord Zed's. Awesome-tastic, menacing and dark, implying a slowly approaching evil. Now the Machine Empire. Not as great as Zed's, but very machine-like and steampunkish, so nice and reflective of the Empire. Now here's Divatoxes. Okay, it's kind of got an imposing quality, but contrasting high and low notes, very short, doesn't keep up with the rock music still present in this season. In fact, it feels really kind of phoned in. The turbo suits... I'm sorry, but the problem that keeps interfering with my ability to enjoy this is the frickin' cars thing. We went from ancient animals and dinosaurs to swift ninja powers to a mystical crystal... 
to friggin' cars! What is the natural progression here? Yes, I know, limited by the Sentai, but did they need to adapt this Sentai? Said Sentai, Car Rangers, was apparently a parody of the Sentai concept, which just makes the whole thing feel even more juvenile, and in turn, pandering to little kids. The turbo suits have the car theme, and it just continues to infuriate me. Why the chrome lining around the visors? What the hell is up with the two smaller areas of the visor under the chrome on Tommy's helmet? No, seriously, what the hell is up with those? It's always bugged me. I've also heard rumors that there was behind the scenes tumult in the writing room about the Sentai, with half the writers wanting to ignore the goofier parts of it and just be serious, while others wanted to embrace the slapstick and lighthearted feeling of Car Rangers. I know many would say that there isn't anything else they could have done given the Sentai choice, but I do have to wonder if Saban was forbidden from using any series pre-Jew Rangers. After all, Sentai at this point was still recording on film while Power Rangers used videotape, so using, say, Jetman for the footage wouldn't have clashed any more than other Sentai footage. Admittedly, I've never seen Jetman, or really any other Sentai, so I don't know how well it would fare as an adaptation, but my point stands. Adapting Car Ranger is just kinda iffy to me. I'm sure others will disagree, and you are free to, but that's just my opinion. Anyway, enough diversions, let's get to the series itself. Turbo begins with Divatox rallying her forces on some planet to go to Earth and take it over, much like every other villain. A continuity error from the movie to the show is that Divatox's piranatrons in the movie are clearly just people wearing armor, whereas in the show they're completely covered and resemble aliens more. And thank God for it. Every time I saw the piranatrons in the movie, they just looked embarrassing. It's not menacing, it's just silly. I keep expecting the rangers to just slap them around, knock off their helmets, and chastise them for their life choices. The TV show version of them is at least somewhat menacing because of the lack of other recognizably human features. Divatox herself, played by Hilary Shepard Turner in the movie, is now played by a different actress, Carol Hoyt. Turner was on pregnancy leave for the first third of the show, but would come back to play the role later. At the same time, it's graduation day for the rangers. That's right, teenage Teenagers with Attitude is over. They're adults now. And sadly, the show doesn't take advantage of this. This season could have easily been about advancing to the next level, having to step up and live in a harsher world. Sure, being a teenager isn't a picnic, but graduation and growing up should have been the next step for the show, dealing with darker threats and more serious topics. Instead, we get Tommy driving around a race car track. You know, that thing he's always been into, I guess. <sighs> Bulk and Skull, getting one last chance to rejoin the Force, are instructed to guard Angel Grove's power plant. However, Divatox's first plan is already in motion. She's gonna set a bomb and destroy the plant, so the graduation ceremony is ruined. Yes, we've gone from invading intergalactic machine empire to petty space pirate. Anyway, Justin's the only one on hand to deal with the situation, so he's sent in to fight Divatox's nephew, Elgar, aka the comic relief villain for the season. Like many things in this season, I hate Elgar. At least back when Squat and Babu were the comic relief villains, they weren't used that often for important missions. Elgar is a total waste of space, and yet Divatox keeps assigning him important crap. He's kind of like Rito, except without the charm and menacing appearance. The fact that Justin can hold his own against Elgar, in other words, the 12-year-old can fight him off, also doesn't exactly make me feel frightened of him as a villain. Why not just use Rygog, who may not be as maneuverable, but actually looks threatening, and he's Divatox's second-in-command. Elgar confronts Bulk and Skull at the power plant, but the dude is so pitiful that even Bulk and Skull, whose regular job on this show is to be terrified of monsters, decide that they can take this guy, even pulling out a cute little baton kata they learned at the police academy. However, as lame as Elgar is, he's still a monster, using a device given to him by Porto, Divatox's scientist, to transform Bulk and Skull into chimpanzees. Frankly, the Piranatrons aren't all that impressive either. Even the cogs were made to be a big threat, even if they didn't turn out to be. But in this case, they don't even try to pretend that these things are anything but pathetic. While the Rangers hunt for the bomb, Alpha and Zordon start examining a wormhole in space, saying that the time will come soon enough to tell the Rangers about it. 
The Rangers find the bomb and manage to get it away from the power plant before it explodes. Zordon and Alpha get in contact with Larigo and bring him to the power chamber as they see the wormhole starting to open to the necessary diameter. Lieutenant Stone finds the bulk and skull chimps and brings them to the youth center, commenting that he's keeping them around because there's something familiar about them. The two's shtick for the beginning of the season is to be chimps, since at the time, Fox was experimenting with the idea of doing a bulk and skull spin-off show that sadly never got off the ground. The two can communicate with each other, but no one else can understand them. The Rangers are brought to the power chamber and are told that Larigo has come to give Zordon his freedom from the space time warp and return him to his home world of Eltar along with Alpha, hence the need for the wormhole. At the same time, something else begins to travel through the wormhole on the way to Earth. Divatox, seeing what's about to happen, has Porto work to close the wormhole and distract the Rangers. The Rangers head out to face some of... uh... Divatox's cars. Ugh, this really highlights the silliness of this whole premise of cars as Zords, as basically the fight consists of the cars ramming into each other until they start the Megazord sequence. There's even a part where Tommy briefly pulls out the manual for his car. Wow, we have the drama of losing Zordon and Alpha juxtaposed with a bit where Tommy reads the manual for his car. Yes, I know, Sentai footage, but if the Sentai footage doesn't match with the mood you're trying to convey, don't use that footage! As Zordon and Alpha depart, the wormhole starts to collapse, risking the two's lives. The Rangers head out to destroy the device collapsing the wormhole and the monsters guarding it. We have Divatox's method of growing monsters, firing torpedoes at them. Admittedly, Lord Zed threw a grenade at his monsters, but I always figured it was more of some chemical composition that did it within the grenade. Not a huge-ass torpedo! Anyway, they destroy the monster, stop the device, and return to the power chamber. Larigo leaves, and of course, the rangers are saddened. Until the arrival of Alpha-6 and Zordon's replacement, Demetria. Divatox is peeved since apparently they know each other. What's interesting is that Demetria is also played by Carol Hoyt. It's implied that Demetria and Divatox are sisters, since Demetria's sister was kidnapped and Divatox was adopted and raised by space pirates. This is backed up by something that happens next season, but we never get an official confirmation in the actual series. Demetria was kind of annoying in the first half of the season, since she always spoke in questions, but she mellowed out later. Do you know who we are? Do you know who we are? Yeah, we're the Power Rangers. Is not who you are much more than the Power Rangers, Tommy? Are the questions you have the reasons your faces have these expressions? Okay, am I the only one who finds these sayings just a little bit formulaic? She practices this because she's from the planet Inquirus. Get it? Inquiry? Question? Ha 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 ha. One could argue it's necessary for the Rangers to grow, that they need to solve things on their own without being handed the answers by their mentor. But when you're in a life and death situation, personal growth is kind of worthless if they're dead and they can't grow anymore. Whenever Demetria started this questions crap, I'm reminded of something a vampire once said. I don't have time for your quirks. Alpha 6, on the other hand, is far more annoying than Justin, speaking in a faux street talk and going yo, 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 instead of ay, 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 like his predecessor. Yo, yo, what you talking about alone? What am I, invisible? Hey, kid, why don't you take a picture of something? It'll last longer. I don't know, maybe Alpha 6 used to be in Team Skull. I have absolutely no idea what motivated them to replace Zordon and Alpha like this, but it's yet another misstep. There's already a lot that the team and the viewers need to adjust to, and a major change like this is done after only one episode! I hate to keep harping on this, but Kimberly's departure was done perfectly, making an entire story arc out of it. Ernie also makes his departure from the series off-screen, Richard Janelle having leftover health problems, leaving the juice bar under Lieutenant Stone's management instead. Because when he said last season he wanted to be a private detective, what he really meant was, I want to serve juice to teenagers. Not sure how the hell this happened, but it's a minor misstep along with everything else. Sure, Ernie wasn't exactly a key character for the franchise, but it just seems like Turbo is doing everything in its power to replace everything from the previous four years. What's next? You're gonna tell me that we lose four members of the team in a two-parter without any build-up? After a ton of filler episodes, the next part of the story arc appears in The Millennium Message. A spaceship crashes on Earth, holding a police robot called the Blue Centurion. Divatox finds him first and tricks him into relaying his message. 
The Centurion comes from the future, revealing that an alliance of evil forces, including Zed, Rita, the Machine Empire, and Divatox, will attack the universe in the year 2000, conquer it, and divide it up amongst themselves. Well, obviously this message is bullcrap since that invasion happens in 1998, but I'm getting ahead of myself. After a series of events involving tricking the Centurion into thinking the Rangers are evil, the Blue Centurion sticks around to help, providing his own Zord as well. Basically acting as Ninjor this season. However, most of the message is burnt out. The Rangers learn about the United Alliance of Evil, but they can't get the part that reveals what stands in their way. However, given Divatox's reaction to it, it's pretty clear that what she saw was a team of Power Rangers. What team, though? What's unexpectedly the next part of the story is a filler episode that introduces two characters, a soccer player named Carlos under Adam's coaching and a cheerleader named Ashley. During an attack at a soccer game, the two manage to fight off a few Piranatrons along with Adam during an attack. Divatox clearly wants the two destroyed, especially when at the end of the episode, she vows to not let the Millennium Message come to pass. Carlos and Ashley appear later on in Honey, I Shrunk the Rangers, but it's only a brief cameo. Part of that one is significant also. In the crater for some of Divatox's torpedoes, the Bulk and Skull chimps get in closer to examine them. The residual radiation and fumes from the crater change them back into humans, but also turns them invisible. Sadly, that brings us to the biggest misstep in the two-parter, Passing the Torch. Now, admittedly, this was also a production reason, since apparently Jason David Frank was interested in leaving and pursuing other projects. He did agree to stay on for 19 episodes of Turbo to give them time to find a replacement ranger. Rumor also says that Catherine Sutherland, who played Cat, was also interested in leaving, so the production team said, screw it, and decided to replace the entire cast except Justin. There might have been plans for only the two to leave, but I can't find any confirmation. I will note that while Turbo was apparently a ratings bomb in the early season, the ratings did actually improve after this change, but only enough to keep the show going for another season. So this change did help save the show, otherwise it likely would have been cancelled after Turbo. Judd Chip Lynn, who was a recurring writer in the series, became the head writer, shaping the direction of the franchise for many years to come. Anyway, I say misstep since we're once again replacing characters in a short amount of time. Forgiving even how Kimberly's departure was so well handled, consider way back when Jason, Zack, and Trini left. We got three episodes that introduced the new characters, two filler episodes that featured them, and finally the episodes where they take place as the new Rangers. Sure, the actual actors weren't there for it, but it was still a build-up. Whereas each time someone is replaced in this season, it takes all of one episode, or in Rocky's case, one movie. Though Rocky does cameo at the beginning of the season, at least. Anyway, the episode begins with Divatox getting contacted by her adoptive mother. She berates Divatox for her constant failure and tells her to get rid of the Rangers. She advises Divatox to take out the leader and the rest will fall. While the Rangers go out camping, we cut to a bus carrying two other characters, TJ and Cassie. Cassie is being annoying, singing rather badly out loud while everyone tells her to shut the hell up. The two meet and exchange small talk. Tommy and Kat are intercepted by Piranatrons on motorcycles. Every time I see these guys, I miss the dignity of the putties more and more. Who promptly kidnap Tommy and blow up his truck. TJ and Cassie, at a rest stop, hear Tommy's truck explode and run over to try to get a closer look. They find Kat being attacked by the Piranatrons and TJ runs in to help, though Cassie is reluctant. We don't really get a good introduction to Cassie, who comes off as annoying and cowardly. However, she is able to hold her own in a fight, same as TJ. Justin, Adam, and Tanya get attacked by monsters, and by the by, it's Justin who's the only one with good sense to try morphing. However, his key gets knocked out of his hand before he can finish. The others get their morphing keys knocked aside, but they do manage to recover them during the fight and morph, forcing the monster to retreat while they go and help Cat. Tommy is suspended over the Vortex of Eternal Sorrow. I imagine it's basically like replaying the season in an endless loop. By the by, the Turbo Morphers are actually pretty good this season as well. They have a series of blinking lights on them. The way to activate them is putting a key into the Morpher, which is still on a wrist strap like the Zeonizer. It's a pretty cool idea, actually. I like it. It feels like an extension of the Zeo powers, which, you know, would have been nice if they just didn't transform the Zeo powers into them. You know, kind of would make sense. Demetrio reveals that they have a limited amount of time to stop the monster, who's suddenly grown huge and is attacking Angel Grove but she doesn't reveal why they have limited time. In the city, we see an army officer evacuating people? 
What the hell? It's this series that reveals that the military does exist in Power Rangers? Where the hell have they been during every other monster attack? TJ and Cassie come across a slime trail left by the monster that took Tommy, and TJ chases after it, Cassie not wanting to get more involved. TJ even says that as a little kid, he wanted to be a Power Ranger. What kid wouldn't want to grow up to be a Power Ranger? Me. I just wanted to be like Tina Turner. You wanted to do music for Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome? However, she does come back to help when she realizes she wants to help her friend. This goes a little way towards redeeming her character, but like I said, this is not the best introduction. Sure, the ludicrous three-minute chase of the baby back in the ninja encounter was annoying, but at least it painted the picture that those three were noble individuals worthy of becoming Power Rangers. Then again, it also painted Bulk as a noble person, and he wasn't offered to take up one of those spots. The two locate Tommy and fight off the Piranatrons just as the rope holding Tommy snaps. TJ catches it, and the two pull him to safety. Tommy goes off to help the others, while Cassie and TJ head back towards the bus stop. The Rangers summon the Turbo Megazord and defeat the monster, returning to the power chamber shortly thereafter. As the time elapses, Zordon and Alpha 5 contact the team, Alpha's even back in his original body, to witness something. Demetria explains that at a certain stage of life, it becomes their duty to let rangers go and live their lives. Each ranger was instructed to select an individual to take their place on the team. I suppose this could technically have been something similar to what happened in Doomsday, since, you know, none of these characters were around when that choice was offered, but it seems a bit, you know, too little too late for that. Especially since I doubt they would just willingly give up the powers, much like the original rangers didn't. But anyway, TJ, Cassie, Ashley, and Carlos have been selected as the new Rangers. Justin will remain as the Blue Ranger since he's still 12. Well, 13, I guess, since he had a birthday during the series. So, these choices. What. The. Hell. Admittedly, Kat saw firsthand that TJ and Cassie were excellent fighters and looked impressed by their fighting prowess, but what did she know of Cassie as a person? Yes, Tommy was rescued by TJ, but again, Bulk and Skull have rescued the team before, and they were never candidates. I'm not saying this because I'm like overly bitter and demand that Bulk and Skull become rangers, just that it's not a very good reason to make them a ranger. Adam has worked with Carlos before, but in his introductory episode, he was willing to say screw teamwork to try to win a soccer game. And outside of this episode, Tanya never exchanged one word with Ashley. This is shoddy, and their justification for replacing the team is equally shoddy. Shoddy. Simply because they're out of high school now, they've reached a development in life where they have to give up their powers? And why wasn't this a thing at the beginning of the season when they graduated? What, the time span is age 18 and, like, three months or something? And what would have happened if the time elapsed and they weren't at the command center? Would the powers have just vanished or something? Furthermore, what kind of logic is it to trade in four seasoned and experienced soldiers in your war against evil for four untested, unknown teenagers? And yes, we are back to teenagers, once again putting the safety of the Earth in the hands of people who have a dozen other priorities and worries going on in their lives. This is just... Wow! Words cannot describe how friggin' idiotic this changeover is. This should have been the team graduating to the next level, dealing with the harsh world of adulthood as metaphor for growing threats and more dangerous adversaries. The stakes should have been higher. The audience should have grown along with the characters, and the characters developed to their fullest. Instead, we've got a friggin' 12-year-old driving around in a supercar, the Rangers tossing the keys to their weapons over to a bunch of untested newbies, our wise leader and quirky but intelligent robot buddy replaced with a woman pretending to be deep and her jive-talking faux street robot, intergalactic empires with armies of deadly soldiers replaced with a woman whose mask doesn't fit right in a submarine along with her incompetent nephew and her tendency to whine every five seconds because she doesn't have the good sense to set her damn explosives for 30 seconds instead of an hour, and we have a police lieutenant 